All right, thank you. Uh, so thank you uh, for having me. Uh, also, thanks to my colleague, Andrew Cania, uh, for suggesting that I apply uh, to this conference. I've really enjoyed it uh, so far. Uh, my talk today draws from a book that I'm writing about lighting in Hollywood film noir. And I, I want to admit right away, uh, I'm a film historian and I'm not a philosopher. Uh, 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 so I've been, I've been doing my best keeping up uh, with the conference. Uh, I'm hoping my comments might touch on some philosophical issues uh, today. Uh, my book includes two sorts of chapters. Uh, one set of chapters uses trade journals, interviews, archival documents to build up an account of how working Hollywood cinematographers theorize their own practices. And another set of chapters looks closely at specific film examples to see how lighting functions in particular contexts. And both sorts of chapters are informed by my ongoing interest in narrative theory. Uh, and I found that one issue keeps coming up the issue of lighting and time. Uh, time, of course, is very important to the theory of cinematic narrative. Movies unfold in time, and they typically represent events that form a timeline. Time is also important to Hollywood cinematographers who thought carefully about how lighting might be used to situate a scene in a particular time. And time is important to the cycle of films known as film noir, a cycle known for its sense of fatalism, and its frequent flashback construction. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today, lighting and time in film noir. And here's an outline. The, I feel like the button is not working. Okay. Uh, so here's an outline of my talk. I'm gonna be listing four different ways a cinematographer might use light to do something with time. I'll start with an example that's fairly straightforward and I'll build up to examples that are more complex. So cinematographers use lighting to represent time of day, to represent historical time, to create expectations about how the story will unfold and to create temporal relationships between scenes. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And all right, so the first one seems fairly straightforward, at least at first glance. When lighting a scene, a cinematographer can show that the scene takes place at day or night. That's a function that working cinematographers talked about often. It came under the heading source lighting. The basic idea is that the cinematographer should approach each scene by asking what log what's the logical source of light. The first step in lighting would then be to imitate that logical source. So here's a passage from a trade journal written in 1949 at the height of film noir. The establishment of the basic source is used. Okay. Okay, and we're certainly not supposed to guess what the time on the clock might be. A light through a window just means it's daytime. 
Similarly, the cinematographer usually doesn't draw a distinction between summertime daylight and wintertime daylight. If it's day, light shines through the window, more or less the same way, no matter the season. The effect can be so generalized that it often seems only semi-logical, in spite of the fact that source lighting is often justified as logical. All right. I can tell you that this scene is supposed to take place near the middle of the day in a city based on Santa Fe, New Mexico. But the lighting doesn't read as noontime lighting, unless we suppose that light is bouncing off the angled glass of some distant window on some taller building. Oh, man, I got, got to hit it again. Sh should I have that thing? Yeah. Or, okay. So. On that. Okay. Sometimes the lighting is not just semi-logical, it's flat out inconsistent, as when it enters the light, uh, enters from the right in one room, but from the left in another room. Hollywood cinematographers were so comfortable with such inconsistencies, they had a term for it. It was called cheating. It was generally agreed you could cheat daylight, lamplight, and all the other effects, as long as you got the basic idea across. You cheat for all sorts of reasons. Convenience, visibility, glamour. All of this is to say uh, that, light, that lighting for time of day is highly conventional, a set of rules cinematographers could apply without thinking about it too much. If the script says daytime interior, then a cinematographer could show up to work, look for the windows on the set, and shine a lamp through it. That said, there are scenes where lighting is supposed to convey more specific information about time of day, not just daytime, but evening time or early morning. At the end of Mildred Pierce, the detective opens up the shades and we see that the night is finally over as morning sunlight floods into the room. Here, the angle of the light is purposeful, suggesting that the sun has just come up. Still, the lighting isn't really different from the lighting in all the other examples I've shown. The main reason we know it's morning and not just generic daytime light is because the characters tell us so. All of these examples involve a uh, time of day conceived in more or less general terms as day or night. There are other examples involving time in a more historical sense. A movie might represent a scene as happening in the 20th century or the 19th century or earlier. For a movie set in the 1800s, a cinematographer uh, with working with the production designer will imitate candlelight or a gas lamp. For a movie set around 1950, a cinematographer might use lighting to represent the modern world with incandescent bulbs in table lamps or fluorescent bulbs in ceiling fixtures. What we have in all of these examples is a mixture of lighting that comes from off-screen standard movie lighting with practical sources that are on screen. So the lights that we actually see in these shots are known as practicals. They're working units placed on the set. But those practicals are not doing the work of lighting the set or the actors. They're not bright enough to do that. So most of the light we see is coming from off screen, arranged to look like it's coming from these sources. Lighting, uh, like the conventions of lighting for day or night, conventions of lighting for candlelight or electric light can be generalized and inconsistent. A scene set to candlelight might set the scene in the past, but not any particular time in the past. And it might mimic the effect of candlelight only vaguely uh, as here, where the shadows are clearly implausible. Still, this, light, this type of lighting uh, can be quite interesting, especially in the case of film noir. That's because the lighting might do more than just suggest that the year is 1900 or 1950. The lighting might also suggest that the year is 1950 and that the sources of lighting within the story world are 10 or 20 or 30 years older than that. So here's what I mean. In Call Northside 777, Jimmy Stewart plays a reporter who's looking for a woman who was a witness to a crime many years ago. She's living in a cheap apartment building and the hallway outside her apartment looks like this. 
The idea is that the space is illuminated by this particular particular fixture, which is already decades old, installed at a time when a building might have received gas or electric lighting. So it isn't just that the movie is using the lighting to represent the world of the 1940s. It's using lighting, along with set design, to represent a particular location within the world of the 40s, a location that's visibly obsolete. Alternatively, a movie might represent a contemporary space as contemporary, as up to date. In this scene from Sweet Smell of Success, the bright overall lighting suggests a mid-century office with sun coming through a large glass window off screen right, and even lighting coming from hanging lamps up above. It's a modern office and it's represented that way, as modern. My point is that lighting can do more than just suggest when something's happening, it can also give a location a sense of history. Let me give a somewhat longer example from one of the most famous noirs, Touch of Evil. In the, uh, the celebrated opening scene presents a complex and vivid picture of the border itself. Los Robles seems dense and lively, and Mike and Susan initially enjoy the flurry of people they see. But the overall tone is grim. We know a bomb is about to explode. The lights provide visible markers of disorder, placing the obsolete and the up-to-date side by side. An astonishing array of practical sources glides across the screen over the course of the three and a half minute opening shot. So here's a list. Uh, the fluorescence in the liquor store, the metal shaded lamp above the parked car, the liquor store's neon sign, the incandescent bulbs outlining three of the colonnade's arches, the neon tubes outlining the four adjacent arches, the fatal car's headlights, the unshaded bulbs outside a drugstore, the neon sign for a soda fountain, the bulbs with metal shades outside the barber shop, the lights of the border kiosk, the four lamps illuminating the Mexico sign, and the three lamps illuminating the customs and immigration sign. Some of these lamps may have existed in the original location, Venice, California, but most have been installed to make the space seem chaotic and complex. Together, they give the location a history a history defined by repeated attempts to acquire the latest eye-catching technology, only to have that technology become obsolete almost immediately. Later, we see another space with a complex mixture of lights. When Hank murders Joe Grandy, it's in a room with another one of those combination fixtures, an unlit gas sconce combined with another arm that points downward to hold an electric bulb. And the bulb that's in there is made to look impossibly dark, as if it too were installed a long time ago. When Hank turns the lamp off, it makes almost no difference at all. Instead, the primary light comes from outside, from another staple, the blinking sign. Of course, the blinking light tells us right away that the scene takes place in the middle of the night. But it tells us quite a bit more, too. Here are five other things we learn about the blinking light. The milieu is modern. Even when we do not see the source, we know the light is electrical because the regularity of the blinking light differs from the irregularity of a candle or a flame. The milieu is urban. The light that blinks on and off tells us that there's a city outside the window, whether we see the city or not. The milieu is commercial. Houses do not have blinking signs. Businesses do, either as temporary advertisements or permanent fixtures. The milieu is probably cheap. In the world of Hollywood economics, poverty is signaled by the image of someone who cannot afford a decent set of curtains to block the light. And the milieu is partly automated. Nobody is turning the light on and off. It's just blinking, creating a separation between people and technology. Put these points together and you have Touch of Evil's surprisingly sharp critique of modern life. With its blinking lights, the contemporary city can seem too dense, too commercial, too unequal, and too technological. Now, my example from Sweet Smell of Success might work if it were only a photograph. You could recognize its mid-century modernity at a glance. The blinking light from Touch of Evil is different. The blinking unfolds over time. My next two functions are even more thoroughly temporal because they appeal even more strongly to narrative understanding. So, uh, number three, 
A cinematographer can use lighting to create expectations about how a story will unfold. The expectations I have in mind are genre-based. The lighting follows conventions that lead us to expect the story to unfold in a particular way. The ensuing story may or may not fulfill those expectations. When a character walks into a dimly lit room, the, dimly, the dim lighting might cue us to expect a murder scene to take place. In the movie on the left, the murder does take place. In the movie on the right, it does not. Either way, the lighting has created expectations that the narrative can work with. This function is particularly important to film noir, where a lot of the movies are both suspense movies and mysteries. I Wake Up Screaming is a murder mystery, and it's a pretty good one. And so I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil it for you. Uh, the entire film baits you into thinking uh, that uh, the overbearing detective Cornell on the left will be revealed as the killer. So it ends up being a big surprise when the killer turns out to be the hotel clerk, Harry, instead. And the trick works in part because of the lighting. The movie tricks us into thinking Cornell is the killer, not because of any hard evidence, but because of his appearance. He's guilty by reason of casting, guilty by reason of performance, and above all, guilty by reason of lighting. More than any other character, Cornell is lit like he's the villain in a suspenseful melodrama. Other characters receive harsh treatment from time to time, but Cornell seems to receive it in every scene. Silhouette effect? Yes. Lighting from below? Yes. Blinking neon sign? Yes. Venetian blinds that cast their pattern on him and no one else? Yes. Cast shadow on a wall? Yes. It's as if the filmmakers were hanging a sign over Cornell, saying he's the murderer, except he's not the murderer. Harry is the murderer. Cornell's been covering it up. By overloading Cornell with the signifiers of suspense, the cinematographer enhances the mystery's capacity to deceive, pointing persistently to the wrong man. The work here is aimed at viewers. It's true that the story's protagonists both think that Cornell is guilty, but they don't think that because of the way he's lit. They barely seem to notice how he's lit, whether he's standing in the pattern of the blinds or not. It's a case where the fictional world is organized in such a way that it produces its rhetorical effects on us, the viewers. We are asked to notice the lighting and to judge Cornell accordingly. Accordingly, and in this case, wrongly. I, I think the point I'm making is, is similar to one uh, that Gregory Curry makes in Narratives and Narrators. There, Curry argues we may approach a narrative from uh, uh, an internal or external perspective. Internally, we speak and think directly of the characters and events in the story. Externally, we see a vehicle, something that represents a sequence of events. Lighting effects that are only semi-logical from an internal perspective may make perfect sense from an external perspective as expressive or glamorous or heightened effects. And lighting effects that are simply ignored by characters may be deeply consequential for us as crucial clues about who's good or bad. And now I come to my fourth function, uh, which often builds on the preceding three. Cinematographers use lighting to create temporal relationships between scenes. By temporal relationship, I mean something like this, before, after, in the beginning, at the end, after a long period of time, suddenly. To complicate matters, I, I want to draw on a, a familiar idea in, in the theory of cinematic narrative. The idea that cinematic narrative is not one sequence, but two. The sequence of scenes that we see and hear as the movie unfolds, and the sequence of events that happen in the story world. To follow the story, we need to keep both of these aspects in mind. Now, I have four examples to illustrate why this is a particularly powerful possibility. My first example involves a classic noir tactic, the flashback. The noir movie might start with the character trying to make sense of everything that has gone wrong. And then the movie might flash back to show us the sequence of events that led the narrator to this desperate spot. The flashback structure is built into the screenplay, but a cinematographer can amplify the pattern by using a memorable lighting scheme to help us keep track of where the movie is in its timeline. An example is Dead Reckoning. 
The protagonist, played by Humphrey Bogart, narrates his story to an army chaplain. As he does so, Bogart's character is seated in a dark silhouette. When the movie flashes back to the past, the lighting is often conspicuously bright. So we spend the next hour uh, or so waiting for Bogart's character to get back to the frame story, where we know he'll be seated in darkness once more. There he'll get one last chance to escape from his dire situation. So I described this pattern, uh, sort of general pattern this way. A dark present introduces a brighter past, which leads inexorably back to that dark present, which finally opens up to an uncertain future. A bunch of films follow this pattern. Double Indemnity, Murder My Sweet, Mildred Pierce, The Big Clock. These films use their flashback structure to play on our feelings of security and despair. We can safely assume that the character will survive until the end of the flashback. But we also know, right from the beginning, that the events depicted in that flashback are going to get worse, bringing the character back to the dire situation with which the film began. In these cases, the repetition happens in the movie, that is, in the sequence as it's laid out to us as spectators. The lighting helps us recognize that the plot has returned to the same time frame it started with. There are also repetitions that happen within a story world, when later events are in some meaningful sense recurrences of events that have happened earlier. The characters might even experience the events that way, as recurrences. An example of this happens in the Betty Davis movie, The Letter. At the beginning of the movie, the protagonist, Leslie, steps out into the moonlight and shoots a man several times in the back. A cloud covers the moon, and for a moment, her face is cast into darkness. At the end of the movie, Leslie steps outside again, and again, a cloud covers the moon, casting her face into darkness. Leslie herself is killed a few moments later. The lighting is noticeably repetitive for Leslie and for us. Because Leslie notices the moonlight, we can guess that she's thinking about the night of the murder. We might even suppose she's having a premonition, dimly aware that another murder might take place. So it's different than the example from Dead Reckoning. There, the church set confession happens only once. The lighting helps us recognize we're seeing the ending of a scene that was initiated at the start of the movie. In the letter, the two moonlight scenes are two separate events happening several weeks apart, but they're very similar events. And their similarities are so salient that the characters can recognize them. The repetition is also there for us, the viewers, though inevitably it'll impact us differently, in part because viewers' understanding of the lighting effect is shaped by viewers' awareness of cinematic conventions. Unlike Leslie, viewers know that the lighting effect first happened in the beginning, and now they may suspect that the 100-minute movie is coming to an end. The conspicuous repetition functions as a cue an indication the movie might end soon, most likely with another murder. To the extent that Leslie sees the lighting as a repetition, she's appealing to some deep-seated belief about fate. To the extent that the viewer sees the lighting as a repetition, the viewer is appealing to knowledge of artistic conventions, namely the convention that narratives often end with repetitions of their beginning. She's thinking about a moment earlier in her life, so is the viewer, but the repetition-minded viewer is also thinking about a moment earlier in the film's sequencing. To understand that the example from the letter is a recurrence of the opening scene, you need to know the story. You need to put the scene in a before and after relationship with the previous scene. Narrative understanding deepens the significance of the shot, helping us grasp why Leslie is experiencing the second moonlight scene as a fatalistic repetition of the first. That kind of, of narrative understanding also informs lighting effects like, like this one uh, from You Only Live Once. The protagonist, Eddie, has just escaped from jail, where he's been imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit. In the process of escaping, he's killed a benevolent priest. As you can see, he feels shattered by a sense of guilt. This is as miserable as Eddie has, has ever felt. It works because the lighting departs from the lighting we've seen on Eddie before. Before he went to jail, Eddie looks like this on the far left, handsome. He still looked pretty good, even when he was in jail. 
It's only after he kills someone that he looks this bad, this beleaguered. The lighting helps to mark the scene as a low point. Note that Eddie has no idea that he looks like this. In fact, it doesn't even make sense that he looks like this. He's sitting in a car, so there's no good reason for him to be lit from above. He's lit from above for dramatic reasons, to make sure we know this is his bleakest moment. Narratives unfold in time, and lighting can help us make sense of this unfolding by recognizing the shape of the dramatic arc, an arc with beginnings, middles, endings, turning points, false endings, reversals, and repetitions. This can happen at a very fine grain level, even within a two or three minute scene. So my last example, in Human Desire, Gloria Graham's character, Vicky, is trying to convince Glenn Ford's character, Jeff, to murder her husband, Carl, an abusive man who's killed someone and is blackmailing Vicky with evidence of her involvement. Vicky doesn't explicitly ask Jeff to kill Carl. She just tells him enough that he'll draw the conclusion himself. The turning point of the scene happens when Jeff finally realizes what Vicky is asking. At that moment, Vicky turns to face Jeff directly. Notice how the lighting helps to mark this moment as the turning point in the scene. It gives the scene a visually recognizable before and after quality that echoes the before and after quality of the drama. Previously, Vicky was standing in the shadows, turning away from Jeff and turning away from the light. Now, at the moment when her intentions are out in the open and toward the light. So let me sum up. I've outlined four different ways a cinematographer might use light with respect to time, representing time of day, historical time, creating expectations, creating temporal relationships. My sense is that narrative understanding plays a greater role in number three and number four than it does in number one and number two. Even in a non-narrative painting, the light might represent time of day or historical time. Indeed, rendering the precise fall of the light might be the primary achievement of the painting. Number three and number four rely on an awareness that the movie unfolds in time. The lighting becomes part of the narrative by guiding our expectations of how the story will unfold and by shaping our dynamic understanding of how it's been unfolding. Notice that lighting is part of the narrative even though it rarely plays a large role in the chain of actions. With a few exceptions, these are not movies about characters who are doing something with the light. They don't accomplish their goals by turning lamps on and off. Most of the time, they seem unaware of lighting. In Touch of Evil, Hank is too busy committing a murder to be thinking about the blinking lamp. In You Only Live Once, Eddie is too busy feeling guilty to notice he's lit from above. The lighting is irrelevant to their purposes and feelings. The lighting is a part of their world, but it's aimed at us, our narrative expectations, and our narrative understanding. Thank you.